Yeah, let me let me start um, before I, I introduce um, Nathan. Um, that um, you know, it, it always uh, is kind of amazing to me what a small world. It is. So, um, are you still living in Piedmont? Or did no, no, I'm in the marina now. Okay. Anyhow, um, the, you know, I'm I'm from I live in, in Piedmont. As is Nate, so um, I, I I know his father quite well because you know he was a coach for his um, Nate's big sister, older <laughs> sister, and my daughter. Um, so you can kind of you know, figure out the, the, the history, the trajectory that we have. Um, and so uh, Americans, you know, we really like to use. Um, Sports as metaphors for for life, you know, it's um, you know, more of a, of an American kind kind of tradition that um, you know people in foreign countries don't don't necessarily know. But the one that um, is relevant here is keep your eye on the ball. You know, that's that's something that applies to many many different sports and to life. Okay, so um, anyhow. Um, you know, Nate, um, you know, he, he, he finished his um, you know, high school in Piedmont. And then he went on to USC where he got two masters, two, two, two degrees? Two bachelors. Two ba in business and... Economics. Okay. Um, so um, yeah, he um, finished that um, you know, a couple of years ago and joined um, you know, BFIG, which is... BTIG. Um, the, yeah. Um, and so, and anyhow, I'm I'm going to um, you know, turn it over to uh, to him, but you know he's he's going to explain how um, you know people in, in investment banking use financial information to support their their clients and their customers. So you know, um, you know investment bankers are, are ones that they they are intermediaries, and I tend to think of the. Uh, um, the buy side and the, the sell side. So yeah, the yeah. In, okay. an investment okay. bankers so on the buy side. It, do you have? It. Did you get my uh, email by any chance? Okay. Okay. So. Oh, perfect. Oh. Yeah. Okay. And um, yeah, you can you can drive and you you can use this. To, um, oh, that's fine. I'll just go yeah, so, like so, this. Or, yeah, okay. It's easier for me. It, is, it, it also has a, a laser pointer. Oh, okay. Okay, so let me scoot by. Let me get out of the way. How's it going, everybody? My name's Nate. Um, as it says up there, I am... Can I squeeze by you? Mm -hmm. Yep. <coughs> wait, yes. wait, 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 wait. All right. <coughs> Photo op. We could... Are we recording? Yeah, you already started. Okay, sorry, go ahead. So, I guess it says up here that I'm your guest lecturer for the day. Um, I thought that that was kind of funny when I was putting these slides together, though, because it's hard for me at a junior level to say that I'm lecturing anyone, per se, but I kind of want you guys to look at this as an opportunity to have sort of a candid conversation with me. There's going to be a lot of time for Q&A at the end, um, but basically, I want to give you guys a better idea of um, kind of the world of investment banking. Specifically, Peter wants me to go through how we use financial statements in our day to day. So the second half of this presentation is basically going to be how I use some of the stuff that you guys learn um, in this class to, you know, do my job. And um, I will say, just before we get into any of this, that finance is, and financial analysis is sort of the foundation of, you know, business and the language of business. So, no matter what you guys are sort of thinking about doing, it's instrumental that you, at the very least, can demonstrate you've tried to, you know, understand financial statements. You don't have to know it extremely well, and in fact, in school, I think that I, you know, memorized more about financial statements than I did, um, than I know now, because, you know, you're staring at a screen, you interact with them all day, and you understand them, but, you know, I'm sure that you guys might even have a better understanding of 
the intricacies of financial statements. So, you know. Anyways, I won't bore you to death with, you know, how they all link together and whatever. I'm sure you guys study that in class. And so, basically, I'm going to go over the first section of this, which is, there we go. Um, an overview of investment banking, just so you guys get a quick rundown of sort of where I sit in both the investment banking world and within my firm specifically. So this is a little summary slide. This is actually something that we showed a lot of our clients, but basically BTIG is an enormous institutional equities trader. And what that means is that we um, conduct sales and trading for a lot of institutional investors. And so these are some of the people, I don't know if you guys recognize any of these names, but these are some of the people that um, were bigger than. This is one of our show off slides, so you know, it doesn't necessarily have as good a context, but if you can picture it, anyone that's in a bulge bracket, which means companies that do you know, deals over a billion dollars, like a Goldman, like a Deutsche Bank, Credit Suisse, any of those companies would be above us. And so you're looking at BTIG kind of in that middle spot where we deal with a lot of large um, investors and we do a lot of volume of trading and deals. But, you know, so we're bigger than the small guys, smaller than the big guys. You know what I'm saying? So you're yeah. a middle market. Yeah, yeah, and, and essentially, but it'd be more on the bulge bracket side of um, deals and sort of equity volume trading. So what would you say your deal size range is? Uh, we can do any, it depends on what we're working on specifically. So it can be anything from um, like a micro cap where we'll do, you know, an equity deal for the smaller guys versus the larger debt offerings, which I'll get to in a second, but um, we're heavily involved in the debt side of things. So not so much, um, you know, the flashy equity deals that you see. We clean up a lot around like the mid cap, um, you know, 500 to like 750 million um, debt deals. Um, yeah, but anyways, 500 employees worldwide, um, 125 sales professionals, those are all the sales and traders. Um, BTIG was founded as a sales and trading institution. It was founded by someone who left uh, Montgomery Securities, which was acquired by Bank of America, and then a uh, head trader at Spear Leeds in New York left, and they joined forces, created this company. And so about five years ago, they started building out their investment banking practice which is why they've been on a spree of hiring and actually when a lot of these investment banks are shrinking in size, we're actually growing, which is pretty cool. So, you know, you see, um, I see a lot of new faces every day. I'm one of them. I've been there for four months, but I've learned a ton while I was there already. So, um, I don't imagine that we're gonna get bigger. Um, Co-headquartered co in New York and San Francisco and I, yeah, so, anyways. Trying to get through the summary slides really quickly. So this is an overview of investment banking. And uh, at, at a specific firm, you'll have, especially some of the larger bulge bracket firms, you'll have different coverage groups between, um, between you know, the investment banking uh, practices. So my group, this group that I'm in right here, is the Home Builders, REITs, and investment bank, or, and insurance investment banking groups. And specifically, this is again something that we show to clients, but um, I wanted to show this to you guys because it kind of demonstrates the columns versus rows, which I'll explain a little bit more. But um, I like to think of in investment banking sectors as columns. So you'll have you know, different sectors, you'll have a home building sector, you'll have a TMT sector, you'll have healthcare investment banking, consumer banking. Those are all different spaces that investment banking professionals specialize in. And then you've got products, which are like rows. So there can be products offered across these, which you'll see on the next slide. Anyways, I'll talk about it. Um, a product would be an equity offering, 
an at-the-market offering, a straight debt offering, um, a convertible, and so that's the group that I'm in. Um, it's the convertible desk that specializes in convertible debt. So, although we we are you know primarily focused on banking, um, insurance companies, and home builders, we my my managing director David Fullerton right there, who Peter knows really well, um, specializes in. Uh, convertible debt, and so he can go to any sector. Let's say a TNT investment banking director comes up to us and says, "Hey, my client's interested in issuing convertible debt." He'll take Dave onto his team for that deal and sort of employ his expertise to sort of, you know, walk through an investment banking pitch with him. So, um, TNT? TMT is Technology Media and Telecommunications. So any tech deal that you see um, is going to be a TMT banker. Um, they loop those in just because a lot of the comps are similar for that sector. Um, and yeah, this is another slide. So kind of, if you think about this presentation as a funnel, it's going to get more specific to what I do, and then it's going to get to my day-to-day -day work. So we just went from sort of a broad overview of investment banking and specific sectors and products that are offered. Now you're getting down to one specific product and the team at VTIG that works in this space. So um, this is something that uh, our firm kind of prides itself on. It's got a large uh, convertible debt desk. So there's convertible origination restructuring and that's basically the pitch side of things. That's really where you get into sort of um, the sell side of investment banking where you're offering a service to your clients and you're trying to convince them to basically go with your company to kind of work through a deal to get them funding. So, and again, kind of going back, the basic idea of investment banking is to sell a service. You're on the sell side because you are trying to you're trying to help people help themselves by mostly getting funding. And so convertibles is just one way that you can get funding for your company. And um, anyway, so we'll run through like a convertible originations and restructuring, the pitching side of things, sales and trading where you're actually trading the um, product that you're offering or that the client's offering at that point if they decide to join in with you and then there's you know specific types of um, sales and trading on the right in those two columns. So that's kind of how the convert desk is structured at BTIG and so this kind of gives you an idea of where I am. Bottom of the totem pole. Um, got a bunch of people above me and that's one thing that I'd say about investment banking is that it gives you a tremendous opportunity to learn from people that are much, much smarter than you. And so these guys have been working in this business for a very long time, and it's almost a continued education, um, you know, sitting on one of these desks and being a part of some of these deals that happen. Um, next slide. Okay, so getting into the sort of market of convertible debt, do any of you guys follow the like Wall Street Journal? Do you guys you know read sort of market reports, or is that is that something that's on your guys' radar at all? A <clears throat> little bit. If you're interested in if you're interested in getting into investment banking, that's something that is super important to the people that work in the field because I'll give you context first. This is a list of all the deals that have been done in since March of just convertible debt. And so this is people's livelihoods. This is uh, what you know investment banking professionals get paid on, the amount of deals that come out. And so if a market's super hot, like it is right now, if you guys have been keeping up with it, the market is incredibly hot for convertible debt specifically. And the reason that that is is because um, a lot of convertible like hedge funds, people that specifically invest in only convertible debt, are clamoring for these securities. 
And so companies have been able to get really good terms on some of the debt that they issue, meaning they have to pay a very low coupon rate to their lenders. And so the convertible market is white hot, and so that means that our desk is super busy trying to participate in uh, this market. And so this is a little breakdown of you know some of the stuff that we look at every day and show to clients trying to tell them, hey, look, everyone's doing this. You guys got to get in on this hot market. Let us be part of that transaction when you guys raise a bunch of money. Um, this is another slide that we show them, but yeah. And so this is sort of another show off slide, I guess. I, I just wanted to put this in here so you guys understand uh, what you know? What the investment banks are doing it for? They're doing it for the commission fee that they get on these um, on these deals. And so a BTIG, you know, wants to wants to have as many of these tombstones as they can possibly get in their arsenal. But that being said, you also want to do it well. So these these deals, some of them that turn sour, maybe the company goes south, or you know the the deal doesn't work out, whatever, that's, that's, that's a poor reflection of your company. And so it's incredibly important that when you approach some of these people that you do a lot of financial analysis, a lot of vetting to make sure that they're a strong candidate to be associated with your firm. Because, I mean, once the deal goes through, you're, you know, you're locked arm in arm for eternity because you're always on their rap sheet. So now we sort of get into. Can you explain a little bit more about what you mean by having a deal go well or go badly? Sure. So I'll give you a very specific example of something that the company is actually worried about right now. So Digital Turbine, this one right here. We did a convert note offering for them, I think, two times within the past year or so. And this company recently has been trading around a dollar, hovering around a dollar. And I think it's on the New York Stock, or no, it's on the NASDAQ. And so these um, exchanges, there are you know two main ones really in the US, the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ. There are a couple other ones, but those are the main ones to focus on. This one's listed on the NASDAQ, and the NASDAQ has very specific listing requirements, meaning that you have to meet a certain number of you know, thresholds to continue to be listed, otherwise you're turned into what they call an over-the-market, or over-the-counter um, security. It's like, a, did, did any of you guys see Wolf of Wall Street? This is a horrible example, but uh, penny stocks and like the pink sheets, that's, that's an over-the-counter security. And so it's not anything against those companies per se, but it's, you know, if you, if you fall down out of the graces of the NASDAQ, you start listing under a dollar and they boot you out, that's what you become. And so it's tougher to swallow as an investment bank when you've engaged this company and you've tried to then sell their security to a bunch of institutional investors saying, look, hey, this is a great thing for you to own. Um, we want you to get involved in this deal. You sell them their securities and these people fall out of graces with the market and they're no longer worth anything. Your investors that you just sold that to are gonna come back to you and say, yo, you know, what, what's the deal? You just, you just pitched me on, you know, the next best thing since sliced bread and they're delisted now. So that's what I mean by, you know, stressing the importance of kind of vetting the companies that you work with. Um, that comes with financial analysis, that comes with, you know, meeting the, the um, like the CEO, the executive suite officers, and sort of talking to them about their business plan has to do with their track record, which again ties back into their financial performance and you know financial analysis of their past, and sort of linking that to where they're going in the 
future. So, um, did that kind of answer your question? How about a one that um, has gone well? Okay, um, so I guess it's an equity offering, an IPO that everyone's like, that, that's what people are most familiar with, so I think that that's the example that I'll use, but let's say an IPO, okay, damn it. I'm thinking about Snapchat because that's the most recent one that everyone knows about, um, but that one went horribly. So let's just say a company goes public. They go public at $17 a share and that's their, that's their offering price and then they start trading at 24. If that stock continues to go up, <coughs> it's obviously a good thing for everyone who's bought that stock and for everyone who continues to invest in it and for you know, the owners of the company and for the investment bank. For the investment bank specifically, that means that you price the offering right and that you've sold something to investors that can appreciate, which you know, by the definition of an investor, you're looking for something to invest in that you get return on capital in the future for. Um, and so, something going well would be an equity offering that you know continues to appreciate. It's an it's an Apple stock that you bought at the issuing price of twelve dollars. That's now worth a hundred and fifty, whatever it's trading at right now. Or Amazon, you could have bought that at five dollars, and now it's trading at nine ninety two. So. Those are examples of you know things that go well, and so your goal, your goal is to have a lot of these tombstones, but it's also your goal to you know partner with the right companies and um, sort of you know have an attractive history in terms of the companies that you work with, because no one wants to work with someone that you know oh. Did you hear about BTIG's last deal? Yeah, the company's delisted now. So much for that IPO. You know, that's, I don't know. It's, it's a negative view to have, but it's you get the idea. It's sort of, you know, partnering with good companies and sort of a brand and brand sort of relationship. You know, you make each other look good. Yeah. I mean, would you say that a way to describe it is trust? Your clients have to trust you and trust you. Yeah, clients. so. Yeah, I, w I would definitely say that, but you're talking about the company or the investors that you're selling to? Yeah, definitely. You know, on, it's, the buy, on the buy side, they have to trust you, you know. Right, right, exactly. I, that's a very, yeah, astute characterization of that, yes. Um, how do you find your clients? You go out and pitch them. So, you'll, we keep track of everything that we possibly can in terms of what's going on in, uh, in the market. And so that's why you'll have specific, that was a good question, that's why you'll have specific industry sectors that bankers cover. So, you know, Nate can't cover TMT, home builders, insurance, financials, and what have you, and know every company very well. It's just impossible. There's too much stuff going on to keep track of. And what I mean by know the companies is specifically know their capital structures and where their need for financing comes from. That's the, bit, that's the nature of the business. That's what you're looking for. You're looking to help someone help themselves by getting more money. So if I'm trying to keep track of a million different companies, I'm going to have a very, very hard time staying on top of their earnings reports and figuring out you know, oh, uh, so-and-so has debt coming due in 2018. Maybe they're thinking about doing another debt raise. Maybe I should get in front of them right now. That's, that's sort of the nature of, you know, why you split it up basically amongst bankers is so that you have far enough reach. Now, some, some boutique banks will specifically focus on one sector, one subsector within an industry and try and dominate that space in a specific product. So, you know, let's say let's say uh, Gene Ramirez 
says, you know what, I'm, I'm good at this. I can, you know, I'll just split off on my own and I'm going to focus on M&A within the TMT space, within the tech space, not even TMT. I'll focus on mobile gaming companies that are looking for M&A. So if you can get that niche in terms of these companies that split up and look at, um, you know, different spaces, but, you know, that's sort of the idea behind it, is that you want to have enough coverage across groups that you're effective in covering the markets. And so a Goldman Sachs will have, you know, 500 different investment banking professionals that cover, you know, very specific sectors and very specific products. So. So obviously the people that you're looking to talk to um, have have a finance a financing need that they're probably aware of or thinking about it, and probably other people are talking to them or pitching to them. As Absolutely. To kind of what what is it that sets your company apart, or what? Um, and then I guess my question is two questions. Kind of first, what is it that sets your company apart in in terms of that pitching for that finance? Mm -hmm. And then two, kind of what's your <coughs> process that like you? Because obviously you're talking to pretty high level people within a company, too. Mm -hmm. so kind of what's what's like the ideal process for a person to become your client? Like are you talking to a board or are you going? So to you're never talking to a board. You're normally talking to a CFO okay. and maybe a CEO when you walk into a pitch. And so I'll get into a, a pitch later because that's part of I think what your professor wanted me to talk about was how I use. Um, financial analysis in my um, in my role as an analyst specifically yeah. um, but going back to what you were saying um, sort of what sets the company apart my company um, it's you know when you when when you're going into a situation where everyone understands the problem that these guys are having in terms of their financing needs you're right, you're all pitching the same idea, more or less, you know, especially if it's something as vanilla as like uh, an equity offering or a debt offering. Um, a lot of the times it can come down to how much you charge, um, your reputation, but a lot of it has to do with um, the creativity that you bring to the table in terms of solutions that people might not be thinking about. and so. The convertible debt space is really interesting because, uh, does everyone know what convertible debt is? So, for people that don't, convertible debt is um, a financing sort of method where you'll issue a security that looks like debt, it's, it pays out a dividend like debt, but when the underlying stock of that company that issued it reaches a certain threshold, let's say, the stock's trading at 15 and the conversion price is at 20. When the stock price reaches 20, the holder of that debt note can then convert it into equity. And so they now hold a share of the company that issued the debt. So when you're pitching a unique product like that, that's something that a lot of people don't have expertise in. And so the guy that I work for, Dave Fullerton, um, that's his space. It's something that he's very, very familiar with and he's tracked the markets for quite some time. So he can go into um, any of these pitch meetings and let's say they're looking for a straight debt offering. They want to replace their 2020 notes with 2025 notes. The market's looking really good. They say maybe we can get a better rate. He's, he'll, he'll pitch you that and he'll say, yes, absolutely, you're completely right in looking at that space. By the way, have you heard of convertible debt? There's even better terms there and <clears throat> throw a bunch of stuff at you so that it keeps the client engaged and it's also something unique. And so that's what kind of sets a firm apart is not only the expertise that they bring, but sort of the uniqueness of the pitch. And so, you know, that's something that I guess BTIG prides itself on is, you know, um, bringing highly experienced professionals like my boss and um, sort of, you know, trying to convince these people to go with us. Um, just, so you mentioned about the capital structure, mm -hmm. so I'm just wondering, like, is that um, 
what kind of like capital structure you feel that is the target in your target list to pitch for a comfortable debt K like engagement? So if it, 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 it depends on company to company, but you know, it's got to be um, a healthy company that uh, isn't too over levered, so it can't have you know, too much debt on its books. Um, it also can't be someone who's, or it can be, but it's harder to pitch someone who's never had debt on their books because investors are a little less comfortable in dealing with those sorts of people. Um, another thing that's super, super important is that the company, um, you know, has a strong track record of paying its investors. So if the company's ever defaulted, that's a huge problem, uh, meaning that they didn't pay a coupon at some point in time because, you know, when you issue a convertible debt, it still comes out as debt. And so these guys are expected to pay a coupon for a certain period of time before their investors convert the note. So. You know, strong payment record is super, super important. Um, also, equity appreciation is really important. You know, so as an investor, especially in the convertible debt space, you're thinking about, um, okay, I'm going to give you a more attractive rate on this debt that I'm buying from you. But there's got to be an upside to that, right? I'm not going to give you money for cheaper when you know I could get it for I could get paid more for the same from another company. So why am I giving you um, cheaper debt. It's because you're promising me equity upside. You're promising me that at some point my my investment will reach a certain level where I can convert it into shares and participate in the capital gains that happen in the equity side of things. So um, the company's got to have you know some promise, and where you get promise from a lot of the times is reading into their financial statements. Are is the company growing? What, what rates are they growing at? Um, and so you'll get into all sorts of multiples of valuation through that. But um, yeah, I mean, a lot, it, it all ties back to the financial performance of the company. And so this is a lot of the stuff that you guys are focusing on, and um, it's all very valuable stuff. So once you, quick question, once you, once you guys, you, you have a deal and someone's going to have you uh, finance them, do you, and you guys write the debt, do you guys uh, sell that to, what do you do with that? Do you take it and sell it to other institutions, to other individual investors, kind of typically, who, how, and how do you do it? So BTIG focuses specifically on institutional investing. So that's something that um, is sort of unique. We don't sell shares to you yeah. or me or a professional, <coughs> you know, it's, it's all large companies that maybe have my retirement account right. that are buying these shares and building portfolios okay. or equity, um, you know, hedge funds, um, those those sorts of people. So, okay. and um, no problem unloading the debt. Pretty, pretty much, your you can. I just don't know if you guys are like if it's um, you don't have any problem selling the debt once you fund it, correct? No, you shouldn't, right? Yeah. So if you if you pitch a company and specifically you have you have you've pitched the company and you said, look, we have capabilities of um, sales and trading, which B BTIG does very very well. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have any problem selling their debt, and that goes back to the trust thing. You know, do, do your investors believe in the products you're selling? Are you efficient and effective in selling it to them? And um, so, if you have if you have a problem selling whatever you put your name behind, that's a problem. You know, that's that's not good. So, uh, yeah. Did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. I just yeah. okay. Because yeah, I figured yeah. you did. I just didn't know if that was if yeah. ever an issue. Yeah. And and the way that banking deals work too, I'm not taking on 100 percent of the risk of, of you know an equity issuance. So. That would be called a bought deal, and that's where I'm buying all the shares of a company that's issuing that, and I'm saying, "Look, I got this. You know, like we we believe in your company. We'll we'll sell it out, and we'll guarantee you that we're selling it out by buying the entire thing from you." That's not usually what happens. What usually happens is there's syndication, meaning that you know there are a bunch of banks that are working together and sort of trying to sell the products, and by doing that, you eliminate a lot of the risks associated with structuring a deal. 
um, because you're only responsible for selling X amount of shares. And so then there are also different types of deals where you know um, there's a best efforts deal where you can try and sell as many as you as you can, and then if you don't, it's all good. Um, there's an all or nothing deal where you know you have to meet a certain threshold of equities sold, and if you don't reach that, it sucks for you. You got to return all the money to the issuer. So you know there are different ways of doing deals, but. All right, so financial analysis and investment banking. Um, <laughs> this is such a corny slide, I apologize for this. Um, but, you know, if you read the Wall Street Journal or if you follow any financial news, you'll see these types of headlines all over the place. Um, there's earnings announcements all the time, and why does everyone care about them so much? It's because, like I said previously, these earnings announcements and specifically the financial statements signal how well a company is doing to the street. And so um, the street in turn, I'm talking about the street as in Wall Street, you know, the markets in general. Um, the street can reward or punish a company's market cap based on earnings. So you'll see stock prices fluctuate all the time. That's based off of investor sentiment, and that specifically um, affects a company's market cap. Do you, you guys know what market cap is? Market capitalization, very simple. Um, and so it's the number of shares outstanding times the sh current share price. And so when people don't believe in your stock, or if a bad earnings report comes out, and it looks like your company's not doing so well, the street's going to punish your stock and reduce your market cap. Now that make it that that may make it harder to um, raise funds in the future, and you know have disgruntled investors when their shares slide. So you know, it's a it's a bad situation when um, your earnings come out and they don't look good. You know, just like it's a great situation when you beat earnings estimates and the stock market. It's like, hey, you did better than we thought you'd do. Here's an uptake in your net worth. Um, Additionally, it helps bankers and private equity firms uh, value companies in comparison to their peers. So an earnings report means that you've put out a set of financial statements. People then use those to sort of compare you to other people in your space. I'm sure you've learned this, but it's inappropriate to uh, compare people across sectors sometimes because people will have different capital structures in different sectors. Some sectors might be highly levered, some sectors might um, have a lot of overhead, um, some sectors might be you know, cash flow negative for a really long time, like the tech space. So, you know, it, anyways, it, it helps people compare companies, especially when they're looking to approach a certain company, whether they're looking to structure a deal with a certain company, and so, I put down some really basic um, sort of ratios that people use a lot, a lot of the time in banking. Um, the leverage ratio, which is you know your debt to equity or debt to total cap, which is just debt plus equity. So it's how much of your um, financing comes from debt instruments. And so you know you'll look at that a lot of the time to see if a company's over levered. That'll be a really high number. Um, versus a company that has a lot of low debt, you know, maybe could look to take on some more. So I might approach them with a straight debt deal or a convertible debt deal, that kind of thing. Um, your EBITDA is a revenue, um, operating profitability. That's basically how much of your money coming in actually turns into a profit after you take off the you know, cost of goods. Um, and then your EBITDA to interest can be your credit worthiness. So someone issuing a debt deal, um, that's a very important thing to them because they need to be able to tell investors, look, these people will pay you back. And so I'm not going to approach someone who looks like they've got a very good shot at missing a debt payment. Um, at the bottom, it's absolutely necessary for investment banking pitch books. So I'm going to... Okay. Um, Are you saying those three ratios are 
No, 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 no. I'm just saying, in general, financial statements oh, okay. incredibly important to investment banking pitch books. Right. So that's now we're sort of at the part where I'm just talking about my day to day job. Yeah. This is sort of my bread and butter is what I put together for hours on end um, and millions of these reports um, for my boss for, you know, when he goes out and pitches a client. Um, we'll put together something like a case study on a company's existing convertible debt. That's what I'm going to show you right now. This is actually something that I put together, I think, a day ago. But um, this is like, this is, this is a way to come to a company and demonstrate that you're extremely knowledgeable about their existing capital. And specifically, something that you think maybe they could restructure in one way or another, and, I, and we can help you do that. So, I have to put these out of order in my bed. But this is sort of a um, case study on a company called Impacts, their convertible notes outstanding. So, um, it'll give you the rundown, this is all, I don't want you to get bogged down too much in you know, point by point because there's a lot of information on this slide, but basically you'll put one of these together and it's a summary of sort of their outstanding debt and our understanding of it as it is and obviously you know, on either side of this you preface it by saying, hey by the way, you know, we're really good at convert debt, show them this slide, this is your existing convert debt and then the following slides would be our pitch to you in terms of you know, what you can do with that. Now a lot of the pitch material comes directly from you know, the, the up above, so my, my boss who you know, had an idea of how to restructure this, but putting these together, this is sort of what I do for him and sort of how I stay in front of the company. And so I'll show you where this information comes from. Um, you guys know about like 10Ks, 10Qs, 8Ks. So, you know, a company will put out these statements, um, 10K is released yearly, and then there are three 10Qs. And so, I think that this one is, oh, I'm sorry, this is not easy to read on this thing. But, um, this comes from the company's most recent uh, 10K, no, 10Q. Um, and so this is information on sort of their convertible debt. Now, this bottom portion here that you see, that's a screenshot directly from whatever the company has issued. So they'll file something. You guys could go to edgar.com, it's the SEC filing website, and find this exact same information. It's publicly available, but you go to an edgar.com and type in IPXL for the ticker, and you'll pull up their most recent 8K and their, or, excuse me, 10Q or 10K. That breaks out um, all of their debt that they have on the books and sort of, you know, the carrying cost of it, the amount that it's valued at right now. And so if you look right here, that, that number says like 49,500. So that's 495 million. And this is 600 million. So this feeds directly into that. And so that's a, a Bloomberg cutout. Now, what Bloomberg does and why Bloomberg can charge so much money for a terminal, uh, you guys know Bloomberg terminals, um, why they can charge so much money for that is because they've basically consolidated all the you know, important things that any banker would need to know and put them in a convenient screen like this. So they've broken down the 600 million that they noted in this convert debt into this little screen. And in this screen, I can also find the current conversion price, the coupon rate, that's the, you know, the amount that they're paying to investors before it gets converted. Um, I can find the day it was priced, um, you know, all this good information what it's trading at right now. So convertible debt, debt trades at a certain amount to par. And so you'll see that the 86,150 is less than 100, which is what convertible notes or you know, debt in general is issued at. And so 
that is a direct reflection of the carrying cost right here. So that's how much it's worth to the market. So that's, I don't, I don't know how many shares this works out to, but basically there are X amount of notes that were initially issued at uh, at at a hundred dollars a note, so you get you guys put that up. But um, <laughs> basically, this is how much it's worth to the market right now, and so that's a, that's directly reflected on their books. It's trading at below par, so it's not worth as much. Um, but yeah, I want I wanted to show you guys this because this is where you know you get all of your information from all these Bloomberg screens. Um, it's incredibly helpful stuff, but this is the kind of stuff that I look at to build out one of these reports. So you just saw, you just saw the conversion premium right here, conversion price, coupon, all that stuff feeds directly from a Bloomberg screen, and so that's where I get all my information from. Um, then we have this section right here. That's just basically a pre-transaction profile of the company, so that's prior to issuing, issuing these convertible notes, this is what the company's financials looked like. They had roughly 70 million shares outstanding, $3.4 billion market cap, and daily trading volume. That's also something that's super important to um, convertible note um, investors, is that there's active trading volume, meaning that your shares are liquid. Um, it's really hard to cash yourself out of a good position if no one's buying. So um, that's super important. But you'll see that these numbers come directly from this screen. So this, all the, I'm sorry, this is way harder to read than it was on my computer. But this screen is a breakout of the company's um, income statement for the past 10 years. and so. You can imagine if you were in banking in the 80s or the 70s, you'd have to go through every single 10K, which is about you know, 300, 400 pages. That's an exaggeration, maybe 200 pages. But a lot of pages you'd have to flip through to get those two numbers. And so this, this is the 640 something that you saw on this page. 646.5, um, and then I think that the other one was net income. So at the bottom you'll see net income. So that's you'll you'll see you'll take these screens and then you'll feed them into a template like this, and you'll build out a comprehensive view of um, you know a company's notes that they've issued. And um, <laughs> yeah, I mean. That's, that's a lot of what I do is sort of helping my managing director understand um, sort of the position that the company's in and how we can better help them. And so you'll put this stuff in front of a company to demonstrate that you are knowledgeable about them and that you, you know, are willing to work with them in an informed capacity. So um, yeah, that's, that's about it. I would say just one final note on this, you know, it seems very comprehensive and I think that that's one of the great things about investment banking is that it teaches you to be, you know, very detail oriented and um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a very detail oriented space and, you know, if you guys are looking to get into it, I'm happy to talk to you more. Um, either via email or, you know, there's my cell phone number right there. Um, but, you know, it's a great place to work, um, BTIG and investment banking as a space in, in general. Um, and you will learn a lot and you will use a lot of the information that you've learned already, specifically in this course and in the um, MS of Finance, you know, master's program. So. Um, I would encourage you guys to reach out, of course, but um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy this. I kind of just babbled for 30 minutes, but um, yeah. Thank you. Any, 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 any more uh, you know, questions? Or questions? Yeah, 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 go ahead. So, have you done any privately traded company 
these? Uh, have I worked with many privately trained? So if so, you do that, you know, how do you find, do the research and you know, how do you get all the... You know, it's a lot harder, right? Because these guys aren't, they're, they're not reporting to the public. Right. So it's a lot more difficult to do a deal with a private company. Um, you can still approach them for, you know, banking work, especially in the IPO space, because <coughs> that's, that's pretty easy. But um, in terms of the fact that you know, you know exactly what they're looking for. Um, private companies will, will come to you um, some of the time, especially if you're a bulge bracket firm, looking for a very specific uh, way of raising capital. So, you know, Spotify just did a billion dollars in convert um, funding, and they went to Goldman Sachs and they were like, look, we want to do this. Um, how much money can you give us? They originally thought that it would be a $500 million deal, it ended up turning into a billion dollars because everyone wanted a piece of Spotify. So it's not, it, it's a little less accessible, I'd say, if that, I don't know if that answered your question, but it's a little less accessible in terms of the fact that you don't really know for sure what a company's you know, financing needs are if you can't look at their financial statements. Um, and you know, public companies are public for like a reason. They're they're well known. They have some brand name behind them, and um, you know, comes with the territory that um, it might be a little harder to get access to some of those less well known companies. But that's also a competitive advantage. People that can get in front of those companies and convince them to do deals with them. Yeah. Um, I, I have a follow on question. Um, do you ever do uh, projections? or forward-looking statements for your uh, projects, your client companies? So research analysts will do a lot of forward-looking stuff. Um, we mostly approach people in the sense, uh, specifically talking about my group, because you know that's mm -hmm. what I'm most familiar with. Um, we mostly approach people with you know kind of current solutions um, to, you know, let's say, a debt that's coming due soon, you'll look at that and you'll say, hey, you're going to have a need to address that soon, let's get on a deal. Or you guys might be looking to issue equity in the future, maybe not right now, but let's put in at the market program in place and you can you know, issue equity in the future. I, we don't model out too much into the future. Um, we actually were just on a... Um, one of our research analysts that covers the home building space, um, ha like hosts basic, basically like a monthly call for um, bankers in home building, and we were just on that with him, and he was talking a lot about sort of forward-looking stuff that he does and modeling out certain scenarios where a deal goes through for this company, or you know they um, this company sells X amount of homes, yada yada. What will their um, multiples look like then, um, maybe there's a merger in their future. That's where most of the modeling um, in terms of, you know, the unknown, the future comes from. Um, I don't really have to look at that stuff though, fortunately. Sorry, another question. Yeah. So has it ever happened that, you know, a deal has gone to means you've agreed and then the company is withdrawn from the... It happens all the time. Okay. And that's... So uh, what happens in that instance? Will they pay you some compensation? Yeah, so you'll have... There, there are things that are called like a tail fee, um, where basically you've been in talks with a... I, I see, I, I'll come to you. Um, where you've been in talks with a company and you do a lot of due diligence for these companies that you're trying to pitch, obviously because you want to look knowledgeable and you're basically trying to sell them on the product that you want to be involved in with, like on their account. Um, so, you know, you've done X amount of work, you've worked really hard to convince these people that you're the right bank to go with, um, and then, you know, an earthquake happens in Nigeria that wipes out their plant, and then they have to step off of the stage for equity raising and address the problem, you know. So, like, split second, some free stuff happens, and the deal falls apart. You just did a bunch of work for them, and you're kind of like there with open hands, like, dude, like, 
throw me a bone, you know what I mean? So you'll, you'll have these agreements where you're not left with nothing after you know, engaging with a client for you know, six to 12 months. And obviously those, um, those tail fees get bigger the longer you go in contract talks. So um, yeah, you can, you, you'll definitely still get paid, but it happens all the time. You know, for one reason or another, let's say, you know, investors catch wind of a deal that you're about to do and the stock price skyrockets, making it, or no, it's a bad example, the stock, it, the stock plummets because investors don't like it. Now you're effectively raising, you're effectively issuing a lot more shares than you wanted to to get the same amount of capital. Then the deal falls apart because you're like, look, I'm not going to give away half of my company to raise, you know, the same amount of capital that I was a week ago. And so that may be the bank's fault, that may be an insider's fault, but either way, you're going to get paid for the work you've done if you've structured a contract correctly. And, um, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. So, is there any sort of insurance on behalf of the company? If a deal fails, so they are covered in a way? Yeah, yeah. There's, but that's mostly like contract stuff. I'm, I'm not, I'm not too familiar with it. I'm only familiar with like the existence of these sorts of you know contracts that people sign. Cool. Thanks. Um, what do you like most about your job? Probably, and probably what's the most challenging part about it? Um, I I really enjoy what I do right now. I think that it's very uh, exciting to be um, sort of engaged in the markets at all times. You, you feel like, especially I sit out on the trading floor, which is kind of a unique perspective to have as a banker because those guys are chattering all the time. And they're basically on the clock from market open to market close. And so, you know, taking a pee break for them is losing money because they're not on the desk making phone calls. But um, those guys are super active, so you get to be around them and you see them being engaged in the market. But then you're also, as an investment banker, you're actively working on deals to create that market that they're working in. And so that's a pretty unique opportunity, I would say. That combined with the ability to work with just really smart people. You know, not too bright of a guy, but I like being around smart people. and. Uh, and they definitely make you better. You know, there's always someone that you can learn something from, no matter who you're working with. And that's that's a unique perspective. I'd say there are a couple other fields like that um, where you can get that. You know, third parts maybe that it's a client-facing thing. So I get to go out and smile and meet people and you know, try to convince them to buy something that I'm selling. You know, it's a little bit of sales in there. Um, it's, it's a really unique field, so, you know, like, again, like I said, um, my contact information's up there, emails are best. Um, what about the most challenging part about your role? <clears throat> most challenging part about my role? Um, well, it takes some getting used to waking up at five. Um, <laughs> that's, that's interesting. Uh, so, yeah, uh, not looking like a pile of crap when you walk into work is, you know, pretty challenging, but um, I'm like a grandpa now, I go to bed at like 7, so <laughs> I'm past my bedtime, but um, yeah, uh, I'm trying to give you an actual example instead of this crappy answer, but um, let's see. Maybe getting up to speed, I think that this is something that's true across all roles that you would encounter as sort of a newer, you know, a, 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 an entry level person in the workforce. It's pretty difficult to get up to speed for the first couple months and the learning curve is incredibly quick. You're expected to, you know, kind of catch on and um, have a you know, smile when you're working like 17 hours a day or mm -hmm. that's, that's an exaggeration, like 14 maybe. Um, and so like, it's like hard initially, but when you get used to it and you sort of, you know, start to engage in um, your role with, you know, your superiors, it takes a lot of support, obviously, so it's important that you work with great people. Um, but, you know, that learning curve is initially hard to get over. And so it sort of tests your resolve for um, the line of work that you're in, because you're not going to work long hours and, um, you know, a 
apply yourself to complex things when you're not remotely interested in it. That's why, you know, you guys are all studying finance. I'm imagining that you guys have some interest in working in finance. So you would, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't put yourself through this if, if you weren't, you know, dedicated to finding a job in the field. And so, you know, it's challenging at times, but you know, this means to an end. Just um, curious about what is the career path like in investment banking, and uh, like what's the um, what's the key Blessings. capability that you focus like to get promoted or become a manager in the future. So there's a very general path to um, sort of the investment banking field. There's an analyst role which you're in for about two to three years. Two if you're really really good. Three you know. If normal, maybe four, or if it's at a challenging bank, you know, maybe it's just hard to get promoted, whatever. Two to three years as an analyst, then you're going to go on to an associate role. So, it's actually a better slide for this. There we go. So, then you're going to get promoted to the associate role. Now, the VP level, sort of missing, should be like right here. And that's an, a promotion above an associate. Now, you know, you can break it out however you, you want, but basically you're getting paid more and you're in charge of more people the higher you go. Um, you're also the one who's in front of clients, meaning, you know, I walk into a meeting and I sit there and try and look pretty. But my boss is the one who's, you know, really engaging in the clients and sort of trying to sell the product. So, you know, you'll spend two to three more years as an associate and then maybe a year or two as a VP and then you know you can get to the managing director level you know after seven to ten years um, that being said there are a lot of exit opportunities that's one of the main reasons that a lot of people I think um, to join investment banking is because you can do a lot of different things with you know, the two to three year extended education that you get as an analyst. So, um, that's something that's super valuable, um, and I think that that's why it's very competitive to kind of get into the field, is because there are a lot of people that, you know, are sort of looking to get out of the field, but in a better position later. So, um, yeah, I mean, it it depends on how, how much you love it, right? You know, like, if, you, if, you, if you're not, if you're not enthused about the work that you're doing as an analyst, chances are you're not going to like pitching the same work that you used to put together um, in the future, and so you may not stick with it. But um, you can either climb the ladder or you know jump ship and go find something better. Chances are there are going to be a bunch of opportunities out there for you. Okay, so <clears throat> we're keeping him past his bedtime. Yeah. So he is first. Yeah. Great. Okay. I have one other question for you. Sure. Uh, so obviously you guys are kind of packaging the deals or going after companies that you kind of feel you could uh, add value to for whatever reason, mm -hmm. right? And you're probably looking at companies um, and seeing that, hey, uh, if you guys close this deal, it's going to be somewhat uh, lucrative for you as your company. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming that since you guys are doing a lot of work on your own, that you guys are, um, your teams and everybody are paid some, some part of their compensation is right. based on on that. What in in general speaking, and obviously I'm getting the sense that actually if you're the higher you go up, probably the larger that percentage is. Mm -hmm. But in terms of compensation and, and there was another slide you had up that said something about um, you guys did twenty five billion in um, in convertible securities in twenty sixteen and you've already done twenty four billion this year. I think it was you just passed it. That was the convertible market in general, so that's how many deals have been done there, and then we've done, uh, you know, three billion in convertible funding. So in terms of a deal, that you guys do a deal, what in terms of percentage of commission are you guys typically looking at? There's generally a commission spread, so there's, the way that it works is that it's broken out into uh, the manager on these deals, so if I had another slide I could show you. Um, a lot of these would be like, you know, lead manager or uh, syndicate or selling group. So there's there's a breakout of what's called the underwriting spread, and 
you'll have the lead manager who's paid, you know, maybe like 20 basis points. There's the uh, syndicate group, which is responsible for pricing, underwriting, and sort of, you know, setting up the securities. Mm -hmm. They get, you know, another 20 basis points. And then there's the selling group, which gets selling concessions. And you can be a syndicate member and part of the selling group, or you could just be part of the selling group. Um, that's what I was talking about. You split up a lot of the deals, and so you're not the only one that's selling securities. And so, depending on you know what part of that underwriting spread you are, you'll get paid a certain amount. But back to kind of back to uh, this slide here. These people don't, like, I, my compensation isn't necessarily, like, related to how many deals we get done. You know, like, I'm a salaried employee, and then you get bonuses. Okay. Um, so, if I brought in a billion dollars for the company, my compensation would probably change. Yeah. But, you know, it's, you're working on deals for a long time, and so it's, like, it's not, it's not totally dependent on, it's not, it's not a commission-based eat what you kill right. sort of thing. Like, that's not... That's sort of what I like about it is that you're you know working hard, but you're not necessarily like you know basing basing your well being exactly, off of yeah. commission dollars. So, um, yeah. Uh, one more question. Last one. Yeah, yeah, last one. Uh, that's about the interview. Was it mm -hmm. hard at the interview? Was it complicated? Did it have multiple steps? Um, yeah. So How there. This it? is actually a good interview, and I think something that's or good. Uh, last question and something that's good to leave you on, um, interviewing. So you guys probably have a pretty good understanding of um, financial analysis, you know, you know your way around a financial statement. You're not going to need to know that stuff by heart when you work in the business. I think that's something to, that you need to understand, but you need to understand why people ask you to know it in the interview. Your, your sort of work prior to the interview, let's say you get an investment banking interview, your preparation for that is very indicative of how you're gonna approach your work. And so, you know, even though you might not need to know how the you know, cash flow statement links to the you know, balance sheet and which line items go plus minus, yada, 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 um, off the top of your head, you're going to use that stuff in the future, but also it's um, sort of a knowledge base that people can easily test on to say, look, this guy knew that he was going to be asked these questions, you know, how, how much did he prepare? How well prepared was he going forward for this interview? So in the sort of first interview, you'll get a lot of those questions. You'll get a lot of stuff that you should know if you prepared well, and you know, that's anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes of them asking you that stuff and just basic fit things. So, like, can you walk through your resume? Um, and can you tell me about yourself? Depends on how technical the person wants to get, but you'll get that in the first round. Then you move on to maybe a second round, and a third round, and a fourth round. Then you'll get to the super day where, you know, in, in between those rounds you're meeting a lot of different people. Um, and the final round is going to be what's called your super day where you're basically at the firm for like anywhere from four to six hours and you're interviewing um, with a number of different people and it sounds intimidating but I would encourage you guys to look at it more as sort of a meet the firm you know does it fit you as well as you fit them and look at it sort of like a stamp of approval thing, you know, like everyone's coming in there because they're going to have to be around you for X amount of time during a day. Can they get along with you and are you going to be a pleasure to work with in the sense that you're smart and you can do your job and, you know, people can tell that from like sitting down with you for 10 minutes. So, um, you're going to meet a lot of people. But, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't let it scare you. It's literally just like walking into a room and saying what up, you know. If you, if you know your stuff, you know your stuff. But um, it's a comprehensive sort of uh, 
um, way to get a job, you know, like you when especially when you walk in the first day, you know a lot of the people that you're sitting next to because you've interviewed with them. So um, if you guys get uh, interviews or anything, um, feel free to email me. I'm happy to uh, sort of walk you through what you might see beyond just what I told you right here. But um, yeah, good luck out there. Thank you. Thank you so much.